The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a rainforest waterfall in Puerto Rico where jaguars flow over the cliff instead of water. It's the world's only waterfall. It always ends up on its feet. Asteroid belts and Promethean suspenders. Plus, we conclude our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have a roundtable discussion with the winner and one of the runners-up of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Contest. Also with us is contest administrator William Ledbetter. The winner is Amy Ogden for her story Dear Ami and Ronald Ferguson for his story Cylinders. Amy's story Dear Ami will appear on the Bain website in July. We recorded the roundtable in a bar in the Sheraton in San Juan, Puerto Rico, so there's a bit of ambiance, but it's an excellent discussion among writers and really worth enduring some of the clanking and clinking, I think. Plus, it adds atmosphere. So, that's coming up, and we continue and complete our audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. Now here's the news. The news is good for e-arcs, of which there are a plethora at the moment, a veritable cornucopia available at BainEbooks.com. An e-arc is the leap into the air a dolphin makes when it discovers it has strayed into a bay full of Portuguese man of wars and the floating debris from a shipwrecked alien spacecraft, whose occupants are actually intelligent Portuguese men of war, who have been brought forward from the future as some kind of elaborate alien pun that went awry. No human would make that pun. No, no, an e is an e-book that is an electronic advanced reading copy. You get the book several weeks to several months in advance. The trade-off is that they are often a bit rattly with typos and such. We've mentioned some of these, but just a reminder that out now are some really great offerings. There is Monster Hunter Grunge, a new collaboration by Larry Correa and John Ringo, set in Larry's Monster Hunter universe. There is also On to the Asteroid by Travis S. Taylor and Les Johnson. This is the semi-sequel to Travis and Les's Back to the Moon. Les Johnson is also a space scientist working for NASA as well as a Bain author in TED Talk Savant. He was also at the ISTC in Puerto Rico, and there he signed copies of his collaboration with Ben Bova Rescue Mode and the book he edited that's part science fiction stories and part science articles. He edited it with Jack McDivitt. That one is called Going Interstellar. And now on to the asteroid is coming up and is out in ERT. Also now in e-art form is 1636, The Chronicles of Dr. Gribble Flots, by Karen Offord and Rick Bodright. This is a humorous entry in Eric Flint's Ring of Fire series, authored by a couple of regulars who write for the Grantville Gazette. Also out is my new book, The Dragon Hammer. This is a high fantasy with swords, extremely dangerous talking animals, Alternate history Viking lore, swords, a young lord coming into his own in a dangerous time, swords, dragons, more swords. So if you are in the mood for some Tolkien-esque high fantasy, check out the Dragon Hammer. Monster Hunter Grunge, On to the Asteroid, 1636, The Chronicles of Dr. Gribble Flots, and the Dragon Hammer. All e are all available at BaneEbooks.com. We are here in Puerto Rico with the International Space Development Conference, where um, every year, not in Puerto Rico, it moves around, we give out the um, Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award, and we are here 
in the bar as usual with writers. Um, maybe not all writers. So, talking after the award presentation, we have with us um, contest administrator William Ledbetter. Hello, Bill. How's it going? Hi, guys. Um, you might recognize Bill from his stories on the website also and elsewhere. Um, right now we have Moonlight Sonata up, and we have another story of Bill's coming up later in the year as well. And where else have you published stuff? I currently have a story in this issue of fantasy and science fiction. Um, I've uh, I had one earlier in the year in uh, daily science fiction, which publishes Flash mostly. Um, and I have one later coming out this year in an anthology called No Shit, There I Was. And it's, it's actually a space story. And the first line in all those stories is that, you know, No Shit, There I Was. And it, it, gets, it, it goes from there. So anyway, I have those all coming out. And the one you mentioned uh, uh, later in the year with Bane, so. You're also a, um, a scientist engineer, right? A software. I'm a mechanical designer, which is kind of like an engineer. How are you connected with the National Space Society also? Well, I've, I've worked, in, you know, I've done this job in, in the aerospace industry for about 35 years, and uh, so I've always been always been a space geek, and I've joined the uh, National Space Society back in 1999, and I've been a member ever since. Uh, they have a local chapter in, in the Dallas area uh, that, that I've, I've been president of and various officers of during that period of time, and... and uh, so that's how I'm hooked up with the National Space Society. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have Amy Ogden with us and Ronald Ferguson. Uh, Ronald is the um, is one of the runners up in the contest, and Amy is the winner of the contest, the Jim Bay Memorial Short Story Award winner for 2016. Hi guys. Hi. Nice to have you with us. Amy, tell us a little bit about your background. Why are you uh, Why are you writing? Where the heck did you come from? <laughs> Um, I came from watching a lot of Star Trek as a child. Um, I have been a science geek as long as I can remember. Um, I studied uh, biology at Michigan State. I dropped out of grad school in cell biology at UW-Madison and uh, I taught science for a few years. Um, so it's never really let go of me. Um, what do you like to read? What has inspired you? Um, I. I try and read uh, a pretty diverse selection. I read fantasy and science fiction. Um, I'm, I loved uh, N.K. Jemisin's The Fifth Season. That's one of my most recent reads. Um, and uh, now I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, oh, and the Ancillary uh, series by Anne Leckie is also... Um, I've been trying to catch up on all the reading I missed. I have two two-year-olds, so I've been reading all the great stuff that's come out the last couple years that I missed out on the first time around. So you're, you're, you're a big reader in the genre as well. I, I am. Not, not so much the last couple years, but I'm trying to get yeah. back into it. You have uh, twins. I do. There too now. Before we go on, Ron, um, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself as well. Where are you from? What are you doing? Uh, I'm from Texas. Uh, originally I was got a degree in, in, in English and mathematics and went on and got graduate degrees in mathematics and taught, taught that in college for way too many years, uh, and decided that uh, writing fiction was more fun than writing nonfiction. Did you, have you always been a reader, um, uh, or did uh, you? Pretty much. I grew up on, grew up on Highland and Asimov, and, and uh, uh, read just about everything they wrote, and then uh, there was a whole long period there, and then, then uh, got to teaching and couldn't read quite as much as I wanted to, but when I, when I got the time, I, I went back to what I wanted to do originally, which was to write. And uh, uh, just textbooks were kind of boring, and uh, you don't have to answer. You've written so. a couple of three math te textbooks. Uh, yeah, I've got four uh, math texts that were out uh, from some of the big publishers. Uh, they were not as much fun to do as, as writing fiction. Mm -hmm. They're, but they're um, for like elementary or uh, junior yeah. high. Or? No, it's uh, freshman college. and sophomore in college primarily. Oh, okay. Hard stuff. Well. <laughs> Apparently, Maybe it's harder, harder than we would like it to be. <laughs> so, um, the title of your story, Amy, is, uh, so, say it for me again. Dear Ami. Dear Ami. Ami, did I get it right when I presented the yes, We just had the banquet, um, which was a lot of fun, and we got to hear some space scientists and such. Um, and the title of your story, Ron, was Cylinders. Cylinders. Yeah. 
So, so Bill, can you explain a little bit what the what this award is about? What are we? Why are we here in Puerto Rico? Yeah, uh, it's jointly sponsored by Bain Books and, and the National Space Society. And the reason that the National Space Society is interested in it is because the, the focus of the contest is short fiction that shows the near future of manned space exploration, uh, which is, of course, something that the National Space Society is very interested in. And so you know, we, we try to get stories that show the uh, show the risk and the adventure and, and the... Uh, um, you know, the difficulty, but yet the, a positive view of, of mankind expanding out into our solar system. So we're not really, we, we're not looking for dystopic science fiction. Right, uh, if, yeah, if, if your rocket blows up and everybody dies, we're probably not, not going to make it to the judges. So. I see. <laughs> or if you think everyone disappears up their, their butts and, be, and enters a cyber world and never comes out, yeah, perhaps not. Yeah, yeah, and... It, and um, you know, alien invasions and galactic empires, that's all, you know, it's all too far out for what we're looking for. We're, we need something a little closer in, you know, you know like asteroid mining and moon bases and, uh, you know, like maybe missions to Europa, something like that. Yeah, these things sound really cool. They are indeed. It's, I read a lot of them and I never get sick of it. <laughs> yeah. So what is the, um, all right, so we're looking for, for not necessarily positive themed but it's set in a positive future right i yeah i don't i don't like showing it, it's so easy in science fiction to so, show technology as the bad guy as the the antagonist of the story and, and that's really something that i'm trying to get away from i mean technology is a tool and it can break and it can cause problems but it's it's all in the way that humans use it so the stories need to be about the people and, and the, you know their their trials and, and and their courage and their heroics that they go through to, to get to the point you know to, to attain their goal. So that that's the kind of stories that we're looking for. And yeah, they don't have to be they don't have to be all happy jolly stories. Uh, and you know, but if it if it's a real downer and, and, and technology is, is bad and if your message is going to space is bad, humans shouldn't do it. Then you're you probably shouldn't send it to the contest. Because we're ultimately going to give you your reward or your award at the uh, ISDC with a with an audience that is trying very hard to make that. That's right. That future. <laughs> yes. Um. So what? When do when do submissions open? When did they? They uh, they open in October and and then they run through the end of February. I think I I adjust the dates sometimes. So I'm trying to remember. I think they run through the end of February. So that's a long, that's a wide window, uh, submission window. We collect the stories during that period of time, and we read them and kind of classify them. And then at the end, after the last stories come in, then we we have to decide out of all the stories that we've received which ten stories uh, best show what we're trying to accomplish with, with the contest. And uh, I, I have a friend of mine who helps me read through the slush, and and she's very good for. You know, for catching things like, well, this is a thousand years in the future, and this lady said a picture in her, in her bikini, so you know, you probably don't want to see this one, and things like that. So, uh, but then we send the ten top stories um, to to the Bain judges, and and they they are the names are stripped off, so they're reading blind. They you know the stories all have to stand on their own merit. They and we've had some fairly. Popular writers uh, send stories in, and uh, and we also all the way down to to writers who've had their first stories published in this contest. So, so there's no stricture about not being published or anything like no. that. No, and and not only that, there's there really isn't even an age limit. Um, it does have to be in English. Uh, we've had winners from all over the world. We've had winners from Germany, from New Zealand, and Canada, and, and Great Britain, and um, so. In Australia, so uh, you know we're, we're looking for a wide variety of, of, uh, of viewpoints and, and different takes on, on man's future in space. So. What? How did you get this connected with ISDC and the uh, National Space? So. Uh, back in uh, my local NSS chapter hosted the ISDC back in 2007, and we. You know, we were looking for kind of like interesting ideas to kind of make our our ISDC stand out, and and of course, being the writer, I 
came up with the idea. It's like, hey, let's have a short story contest. And and at that point, I had just published a story uh, in Jim Bain's Universe. So I knew a couple of the editors at Bain, and I I, and I wanted a professional. Uh, I wanted a, a magazine who would publish on a professional level. Uh, so as, as bait for the writers, you know, it's like. You know, they want to be published. They want pro rates. So, so I contacted some people at Bain, and uh, it's like, um, are you interested? And they were, and uh, um, so evidently it went up the chain to Jim Bain himself. And then, unfortunately, Jim died before the before the contest was even finished. Um, but afterwards, it, it had uh, it had generated a lot of interest, and and, and it was uh, uh, it was very successful. So Tony uh, Weiskopf contacted me and, and asked if I'd be interested in doing this, if I and NSS would be interested in doing this every year, um, and, and maybe naming the contest after, in, in Jim Bain's uh, honor uh, as, as memorial to him, um, since he had been very interested in it. And it's like, okay, so I talked to NSS, they were, going, they were game for it, and it's, uh, it's been going ever since. It's, I, I think it's been pretty successful. How many years have we been doing it now? This is the 10th year! And you've been the administrator the whole time. Yes. Yeah. You're going to keep doing it, right? <laughs> I, yes. I, I, I enjoy reading all those stories that we get. I really I really do. I mean, this is a topic that I'm, it's obviously near and dear to my heart. So, you know. Is there a, a word limit or anything like that? What's the? Yeah, it's 8,000 8, words. And uh, and the winner gets published on, on Bain.com and gets a professional pay rate. It's a real publication, and we have and we have thousands and thousands of readers, um, as opposed to perhaps some other spots. So, um, so Amy, um, tell us uh, a little bit about um, dear dear Amy. What is? Um, I mean, we don't need spoilers because we're going to publish the thing. But um, can you can you set up the story for us? Um. Yeah. I I kind of thought that I liked the idea of um, somebody who might not neurotypical who might have um, some sensitivity to light and sound um, how they might Tell it, read us your well I don't know if we have it but I want to hear that first uh... Nico loved the darkness and the darkness loved her back. Yes, <laughs> that wonderful first sentence of your story. Um, yeah, I thought someone like that um, might really enjoy being um, stationed at an asteroid mining station by herself um, where she wouldn't be exposed to those things that, that might um, trigger her uh, negatively. So that was kind of where I started. Um, and I, when I saw that David Drake was one of the judges, I actually remembered um, a short story, novelette maybe, um, from one of his Hammer Slammers collections that I read when I was in high school. I think it was called Rolling Hot. And it was about um, a bunch of people who were not not the heroes that you'd expect, um, who all were struggling in various different ways and who um, got shit done anyway, and uh, I, I kind of wanted that vibe um, in the story, too, so. So it's set, like, it's set, like, in the Oort Cloud, or where are they? Um, in the, in the asteroid belt. In the asteroid um, belt. Yeah, so. Well, what's the milieu? So there's, there's, she works for the government, your main character. Uh, yeah, she's a uh, part of uh, Asteroid Mining Corps, um, who is stationed in various points in the asteroid belt. Um, they've got these. Um, reusable pods that they deploy onto different asteroids and set up a dig site. Um, and uh, her. Why is she al alone out there? Um, why is she alone? Because uh, it seemed like these small pods would be um, fast and easy to deploy, and if something happened to them, maybe it's not that big a deal. It's one person in one pod, and you recoup your losses and you move on. Um, also, thematically, I wanted her to be alone um, to set her up as a foil with this this other character who who swoops in to be kind of her opposite in a lot of ways, but quite a lot like her in other ways too. Yeah, so she's been out there for a while, um, yeah. and but she's not unhappy, mm -hmm. and as the story goes, um, maybe this is the job for the classic introvert. The classic what? Introvert. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And along comes who? Your uh, secondary? Yeah, and then uh, Maluja shows up, um, who is uh, also, I guess you'd say, an asteroid miner, but not working for um, 
this this core of asteroid miners that Nico belongs to. She's uh, belongs to a group who kind of uses these open dig sites and comes in and uh, does a little uh, buccaneering in space, I guess, almost uh, takes advantage of open dig sites to um, dig more easily without all the expensive investment of setting up um, and uh, grabs what precious metals they can and scoots to sell it somewhere else on the black market. Um, so they they come in to open dig sites of the sort that 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 your main character Nico, uh, Nico is has started and basically raids their yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. so, I see. So she shows up and um, she, who else is out there? What are the Vipers? Uh, the Vipers are the the <coughs> spacecraft um, that Maluja and uh, the other the independents. Is, uh, they call themselves um, the, these kind of raiders. Uh, those are the spacecraft um, that belong to them, and uh, one of them shows up too, looking for Maduja because uh, she has something that they want. Well, that that might not belong to her. Uh, that they're looking for. So there's a somewhat complex ecosystem culture out there in the asteroids in your story. How far in the future is it? Uh, um, I was I was kind of at the outside of the range that the contest was suggesting, some sixty years. Mm -hmm. what? Sometimes that seems sometimes that seems unrealistic for that kind of technology in sixty years, and then I think about what things were like when I was a kid thirty years ago, and what we're doing now, and maybe maybe we'll be even more. Yeah. Well, it seems, I mean, it captured the, the kind of grit and, and um, let's get this done sort of feeling that, that we love in the stories. And, you know, if you had said it even further in the future, we, I think Bill would have probably put it forward to the judges because it was a great story. Um, so these, these, both of these women have somewhat similar backgrounds and they're both trying to help their families. Can you tell us a little bit about the characters? Yeah, uh, Nico has two younger brothers who are still back on Earth, um, who she's in a way trying to be a good role model for, um, and worried what, what's going to be available to them, um, what, what they're going to end up in. Um, some of them, both of them have had some run-ins um, with the law that, that she and her mom probably would prefer they, they go down a different life path. Um, and uh, Maduja has a younger sister who um, she has some great expectations for also who, who she's in space to help too. So both of them are sort of our eldest mm -hmm. who um, feel a great responsibility for their the for their siblings and they don't come from particularly um, well-off backgrounds, mm -hmm. neither one of them. Do you think maybe that's a, uh, I mean obviously it was useful for the story, do you think that might be a hallmark of what we see in the future with um, with who goes out there and who stays behind? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, but right now we see people going to space because they're very privileged um, and you can't, you can't pay, I don't know how much it costs, $50,000 to ride a rocket up to near Earth orbit and back down unless you have some money. Um, but I think uh, we were, I don't remember what talk it was in, somebody was talking about the jobs that robots do and that they're dirty here at or the dangerous. I ISDC. Here at the ISDC. Yeah. Um, that they're dull, dirty, or dangerous, and um, until robotics is at a level that, that's more practical, um, I, I wonder and worry that those jobs will be for people who don't have a choice, who need money, who need something, who are, who are desperate, like the characters in my story, for some other chance, um, doing things that are dull and dirty and dangerous. Yeah. Well, they're desperate. And they're doing things dirty and dangerous, and but they are also um, heroic in that they're trying to to help people that um, their families in particular. Yeah, they and are. it's it's really touching in that way. Um, it's a it's a really great story, and we're so happy that you sent it to us, yeah, and we're going to publish it, of course, on the website. Uh, well, let me ask you, Ron, about your story, Cylinders. Yes, sir. Um, it was it was. Um, the one that I particularly really liked, um, being a father. Um, one of the themes is, is fatherhood. Can you tell us a little bit about the world you created for Cylinders? Uh, yeah, this, this, the situation is, is that uh, 
the uh, solar system has been somewhat explored and, and near to Earth we've got uh, uh, an, an O'Neill type space station located uh, at the L5 Lagrange point where they're doing research about trying to go interstellar. They're creating uh, centrifugal. They're, they're using the opposite rotating cylinders and, and trying to set up an experiment about what they might have to do if they went to the nearest star and there's no planets there, so they may have to build their own facilities when they get there in order to move man to these stars. And the difficulty, of course, is the, is the proposal to do this, is the, called the Prometheus uh, proposal. And the difficulty is, is we don't have the technology now, we're not sure if we will, because the speed of light is pretty much the law of actually sending people to the stars. And so their proposal is to send instead people who are dead or who have not yet been born. So basically, people that are reincarnated in, in android type situations and zygotes to be uh, resurrected or, or incubated when they reach the stars. And this is the early research in it and the main character is an android who is their, one of the first attempts to try to embed a memory from the father, as you said, into this uh, particular android and it's not very successful. And then they have a younger scientist come in who's tried a new method and he begins to install a different kind of memory in for a digital cortex that helps this uh, this android become a little bit more like the girl's father who's the uh, teenager in the story. What happened to the girl's father? Uh, he died of a, of a it's, it's a, a type of cancer of the brain and it, it damaged the brain somewhat and that's one of the problems with trying to get his memory. Uh, but he's been dead for about two years Oops. and he and uh, the girl and her mother have, have moved to this uh, station to do research for the Prometheus project. So he died on Earth. He died on Earth. And the mother is the um, is, is the is the scientist who's She's creating. She's a cyberneticist, it. yes. Yeah. And her task is to try to figure out how to make the. And the pathway she's taken hasn't had real good progress because she doesn't have a good way to get her dead husband's memories in there. But uh, the new guy has a new approach, and they're hoping that that will be successful. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the little, uh, the girl um, characters who's in the story. What's her name again? Uh, I can't remember now. No, no. I always keep a character uh, reference list because I sometimes do global search and replaces to change character names after a while. But she is, um, she's 14. She's 14. And she's willful. And um, yes, she is. She's, she's moving in. Do you have a daughter? Oh, I have two. Yeah. Oh, you do. I yes. see. So you yes. writing what you know. Well, I'm writing what I remember. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what is um, what's up with her? And um, with the girl? Yeah. Well, she doesn't really want to be on the space station. Uh, she wants to be home where her friends were. Uh, she's having her mother has got this project going because she wants the girl to remember her father because he died a couple of years before that, and, and it's, it's beginning to get away from. Her. She didn't really have a lot of experiences with him because he was off quite a bit. And so the android realizes he's not her father, but they're pretty good at making androids and artificial intelligence, but they're not real good at bringing these memories back uh, that you would want from a person to help them remember, help the daughter remember what her father was like and maybe construct new memories. He thinks literally in, in a lot of what the androids, what's his Very name again? Got me again. Ah, hell. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about you asking me that. The android is, is thinks very literally, and um, I, I love the scene where um, she is escaping his scrutiny. He checks where her cell phone is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Stuck to his back. It yeah. turns out she's taped it to his back. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, but um, the, the new scientist they brought in is able is doing some research to... Um, to right. Now, I remember his name is Dan Katz. No, because he studies... They want to do some cats, right? So he's he's bisect his or he, he's found, slice some cats' brains. He, yes, he's uh, well. IBM has done that, but they haven't done it very extensively. They and he's come up with a method for uh, freezing and bi and uh, dissecting thin sliced brains, where he can actually pre-construct the uh, <clears throat> the memory simulations uh, to look like the the memory structure of, of whoever the deceased person is. And I hope that then when they have experiences and you rebuild your... The process is rebuilding memories rather than recall, because a computer can recall, but it's it's just too much data. So they want to reconstruct memories, and they try to use that uh, cortex simulation to, 
to make those memories be like the person who died. Yeah. And so there's these these two sort of um, parallel versions of dad inside yes. the android, and um, he's trying to deal with um, deal with her. It's very touching, and she, um, you know, anything where where somebody comes back from the dead, yeah. he's the father of the daughter. So yeah. it's, it's very touching, and and there's some there's a cool um, animating plot about um, about. Um, some terrorists who are trying to blow the place up. Well, a lot of people not happy with sending zygots to the nearest star. Yeah. It seems like something that would upset some folks. Yes, it would. So. Well, that's great. Um, so, so what, um, what do you guys, uh, how did you begin your writing uh, sort of journey? What's What makes you want to do this kind of stuff? I mean, I mean, it's 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 odd to want to send a story in for Bill to read, <laughs> David Drake to judge. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been writing for a long time since junior high, at least, and I don't remember why I started, but um, I don't think I could stop now. Um, it's just uh, yeah. it's just something I got to do. Um, sending out for submitting for publication is a little scarier, but um, I just if I could make somebody laugh or uh, make them think about things a little differently, um, that would be as much as I could ask for. Right. Well, you seem somewhat cool. introverted. And you were, <laughs> it, it seemed like you were cringing a little bit when you gave your speech after you received the award. Yeah, there's a little Nico, me and Nico, I think. Yeah. I think there's a little there. So, but, this is, but that doesn't mean you don't want to communicate. Yeah, I, I mostly uh, like doing it in the written word a little, a little more than out loud. Mm -hmm. Think about what I'm going to say and change it if I need to, and yeah. revise. What um, if, do you now? Do you write in a writing group or anything like that, or are you just uh, out in the I middle of a, Wisconsin alone? <laughs> I have I have a one particular partner I work with uh, regularly, um, who, who is in Connecticut. So that is also. Uh -huh. we've migrated all our writing groups to the internet, I guess now. Yeah. Um, have you ever met her? Uh, yeah, I met her in St. Louis a few years ago. Um, we were mutual friends uh, from role-playing games before that. Yeah, and we'll be at Worldcon together this year, so we'll have to interact face-to-face -face again. And My goodness, we to even talk to each other. Yeah, yeah so. what a world. Yeah. So, so you are a gamer also. Uh, yeah, I used to play D&D &D and, uh, and um, riffs and some more stuff more regularly before I had kids now. It's a little less time for that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Do you find that gaming and... Influence your writing, or are they two separate areas for you? Um, I found them very. I found gaming a lot more challenging than I thought I would as a writer because it's all improv, and I like to outline and uh, and plan. And you can't really plan unless you're the DM, in which case I hope you have a plan. Um, but yeah, the the level of improv in gaming was uh, a big challenge for me. Who's your favorite character, by the way? Um, my favorite character to play as. Yeah. I had, uh, we had a Serenity role-playing game, um, and I had uh, a scientist who accidentally downloaded basically Wikipedia for the future in her brain, um, and that was fun to play as, as uh, somebody who uh, was very annoying with how much they knew. And, uh, yeah, so a data-like character perhaps. Kind of like cross between Data and River from Serenity. Oh, I see. Cool. How do you? Um, what's your process? Do you with you have two two year olds? How do you get anything done? <laughs> um, I get up before they do, um, and I go to bed after they do, and and they do they do still nap. Thank goodness. So I get some stuff done then. Um, I don't like outlining, but um, my stories are definitely better for it. So I'm a pretty rigorous outliner, and I like to do that in the mornings. That's like a good coffee task, and then writing during nap time is uh, I get my grind out my word count. Hmm. Do you find it difficult to transition from um, the kids to uh, to the future full of spaceships and asteroid mining? Uh, yeah, I got a little Daniel Tiger on the brain lately. I feel like so uh, it can be a it can be a rough time to sit down at the keyboard and get this song out of your head. You need to think farther into the future then. Gotta try new things because they might taste good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Well, maybe it's your salvation, also. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Certainly was for me. The TV, oh yeah. <laughs> Elmo, is, Elmo is my best friend. I see. Uh, so, uh, Ron, what, yes, uh, how did you um, decide you wanted to write science fiction stories oh. after being a mathematician? And, well, actually, I, I wanted that first. When I was a teenager, too, like Amy, I was uh, uh, drawled with science fiction. I'd read it since middle school. And they say everybody that, write, that reads science fiction eventually wants to write it. I don't know if that's true or not. But, uh, it certainly, it certainly was, seems so to the slush readers. Well, but. <laughs> yeah, the, re the reason I got the second major in English was because I intended to write, and yeah. I just got distracted by uh, writing nonfiction, and, mm. and finally got the time to come back and, and, and work on some stuff that I really enjoy. Do you have a writing group in San Antonio? Ah, uh, there is a writing group. I, I don't I don't go very regularly. I'm like like. Amy and, and Bill, a member of Codex, and I, I participated in the uh, Universe Annex uh, writing group or the submission process for six, seven years now, and I found that to be a good place to learn about short stories. Where have y'all, both of you, um, published your stories before? I think both of you have had one or two. Uh, I've had two in the Universe an Annex, uh, three in DSF, two in NewMyths.com, Buzzy, uh, three in Nature Futures, and gee, I don't know, but Perihelion, some other places. I, I don't, I don't remember where all. Um, I had a, I had a flash piece in uh, Daily Science Fiction earlier this year, and uh, I was in the Sockdelegger with their last winter issue. Um, I had a couple poems in Asimov's, and I have one more poem coming from Fantasy and Science Fiction. Oh yeah, I had a poem in Asimov's. Uh -huh. That's how I started out back in 1990. <laughs> yeah. I had a poem in Asimov's actually last this month. It's oh. I am the future poet. It's a haiku. <laughs> so, back in Asimov's after a ten-year hiatus or more. So that's cool though. So you, so you've published several poems with Asimov's. Oh uh, yeah, I've had two. Uh, One was nominated for a Riesling Award a couple of years excellent. ago. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. I remember waiting for Asimov's poetry checks to come um, when I was living on an island in a school bus. Oh my I was actually waiting for a $25 check to, oh. to pay for my dinner. But, uh, yeah. Things come slowly from, from those guys. You always get paid later. <laughs> we'll try to get you paid fast. <laughs> I'm not living in a school bus on an island, so I can... Do you still um, write poetry? Um, I I don't write much. Um, I feel like most of the poems I've written have started out as short stories that I that I realized didn't work as short stories. They um, they were too too short of an idea or too lyrical to stretch out into prose or something. They just weren't working as they were. And they turned into poems and they mm -hmm. clicked. Well, what about longer work? Um, both of you, have you, have you, uh, are you working on a novel? Yeah, yeah. I have one that's finished and I'm shopping around for agents. Um, one that I finished last November that I'm waiting for beta reader feedback. And then I'm starting a young adult, my first young adult novel um, is underway now. Which, mm -hmm. like, I used to, I still read some young adult. Um, and I really love that, that genre. So. Is it all science fiction or is there? Um, they... They are all fantasy so far, actually. Oh. I have a novella that's science fiction. Not a lot that's science fiction, but that's the longest science fiction I've written so far. I have an idea that I'd like to do a sci-fi novel. So two fantasy novels you've written. Wow. Are they, what kind of fantasy? Uh, the first one is uh, portal fantasy. Um, and the second one... I don't know what that oh, is. Portal fantasy is um, when someone from this world ends up in a, in a different okay, world. Okay, that must be one of those terms they throw around on io9, which I don't read. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, uh, the first one's a portal fantasy, um, and uh, the second one is... Um, okay, yeah. somebody from this world goes to okay, a so high fantasy like, land. Yeah, okay. like fa fairy land, basically. Um, okay. And uh, gets caught up in the... Stephen R. Donaldson material. So that's cool. So who's your main character in the book? Uh, my main character, her name is Jack. She, her, she's a woman who's um, dropped out of college. Her mom had been very ill and passed away, and uh, so she 
she's kind of in this funk after her mom's passing, and she's been her caretaker for so long that she doesn't really know who she is um, now that she's gone. Um, and while trying to dispose of her ashes, spread her ashes um, in uh, Devil's Lake Park, which is actually in Wisconsin near where I live, mm -hmm. um, she ends up in Fairyland and has to figure out who she's going to be and how she's going to move on. Yeah. What portal does she fall through? There's somewhere in Wisconsin we could all go to. Yeah, or... we try to keep it a secret because we don't want a lot of tourists coming through. Um, <laughs> That's where the cheese comes from. That's where right. right. <laughs> the beer and the cheese are made by fairies. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, High Fantasy Ron, do you have any novel you've been working on? Uh, yes, I've been working on the Prometheus Proposal, which is a sequel to this short story. Uh, the main character in it is uh, Alistair McLeod, who said uh, he and his family are the richest family in the solar system, mainly accomplished through space exploration. He's the one with a driving dream to go to the stars. And uh, Dan Katz managed, he dies at the beginning at the age 87, and Dan Katz manages to get a good deal of his personality into an android for a good portion of the story. Uh, He's the young scientist we meet in uh, Cylinders. He's the one that was in the story, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you write Cylinders after you I conceived wrote, the novel and everything? Or right, I had, I had pretty much finished the novel, and I, I thought, well, the short story contest is coming up. That I need something that takes place a little bit closer, so I moved back about 20 or 30 years and thought, it's, well, I'll try to set up a, something to go You don't have to reinvent them in No, that, well, that's, yes, I did. That's very useful, yeah. somewhat. Yeah. The, last, last year, the year before, I, did a, I was going to do a, a historical novel at the time of Charlemagne, and I was hoping to introduce science fiction elements into it, including uh, getting air balloons and stuff ahead of, ahead of time. And it's, I like the story, but I didn't get, I don't think I got quite enough speculative development into it. Hmm. What would we call that? We can't, it can't I, be what, steampunk. It's yeah, got to be something I, I else. Talked to, I talked to Gray Reinhardt. We'll have to ask Charlie Jane Anders because yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they call do that sort of commodification of science fiction. We don't commodify science fiction in Bain. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what. Uh, what about the future? Are you guys going to continue with um, with what you're doing? Are you happy with um, this life you've chosen, this strange path you're following? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm happy. I, I really like writing short stories. Um, I used to spend more time trying to write novels that never went anywhere, and I, I really like uh, the short story genre. And uh, hopefully I will keep writing some novels and see where that goes, too. And Ron? Uh, yes, well, I, right. I, when I when I started to write again, I, I wanted to write novels, and I decided I better go back and learn something about short stories before. Well, I how do you feel it. like short stories affect your novel writing? That was, that's an interesting. Uh, uh, does it help? May, well, mainly it got got me used to thinking in terms of scenes and and, uh, and motivation and trying to get get a lot of stuff in, a, in fewer words because uh, sometimes you get a lot of characters and a lot of stuff going on in the novel. Mm -hmm. And you have to compress the information and the and, imagery. And yeah, and, and I'm, I'm having trouble now. My short stories keep getting longer and longer. And I don't know what I'm going to do about it because there's no market for the really long ones. Yeah, I feel like short stories really force me to create a specific image that I'm trying to communicate. Whereas novel scenes, mine had always tended to be white box syndrome where people are standing and talking face to face in a white room and creating that like, impactful image. Over to it seems like it's also related to your um, to your poetry, then. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you give him less space to create a meaningful image in, in 30 lines or so. Yeah. Cool. Well, best of luck in your in continuing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, so, what's what's next for our uh, our dear contest, Bill? Are we gonna the I'm next? When was the next one open? Uh, October. And uh, we'll be we'll be looking for uh, all these new submissions from you guys. Um, I also wanted to take a minute to to mention the sec uh, the other uh, runner up uh, in the contest. Uh, there was always there's always two, and her name is Jennifer Brozak, and uh, she wrote a great uh, story called "To Inherit the Stars" um, about an asteroid miner who finds a long missing asteroid miner who's become a legend and. Yeah, that was an excellent having, uh, story. She ends up having some very uh, tough personal decisions to make regarding uh, the find of this guy, and so it was a, it was an excellent story too. I just, I was, it's too bad that she couldn't have joined us here. This, 
at the ISEC. Yeah. Um, Jennifer is um, is also a, an editor. We didn't know this, of course, when we were reading stories. She's an editor of um, one of our uh, short story anthologies that we put out, um, which was uh, Shattered Shields. Oh, really? Uh, we did a um, military high fantasy anthology. She and Brian Thomas Schmidt edited together. That has some really great stories in it. And, um, Jennifer's around a lot of places. She's um, she's a force in the uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So, so. Well, thank you guys so much for being with us. Um, these stories are. Um, dead. Let's say the titles again, dear. Dear Amy. By sure. Amy um, Ogden and Cylinders by Ronald Ferguson. Cylinders by Ronald Ferguson, and we're they're both going to eventually pop up on the Bain.com website. So. Check them out. We hope that um, we hope that just doing the contest has brought you some great reading, listeners. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Adjourn. Thanks. Well, we're already in the bar. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Rob had put his arm over his eyes when the door clicked to keep from being blinded. He heard something rattle on the floor, and Gwyn's comment about pirates still in mind panicked that it might be a flashbang. That will help your eyes adjust the guy on the other side said. Just slowly let them creep open. How many? Two, Rob answered. You Coast Guard? Wolf Squadron, the guy said. We've got some Coasties with us, but it's mostly a volunteer civilian effort. You sound in good shape. Stocked up, Rob said, shifting his arm just enough to get a little light. It was blinding, and he quickly covered it again. And there's a water tap in here. Can we get out now? Wait for us to finish clearing this area, the guy said. Get your eyes a little adjusted. You know of anyone else in this sector? Other than the infecteds, Rob said. No, and all those are dead up to the main sector hatch. There are some on the other side. That hatch 461 that leads up to the main passenger area? A female voice asked. Yeah, took care of it for you, she said coldly. If you guys can walk, we'll finish clearing, then come back for you, the guy said. Just hang in there another 15 minutes, no more. Oh, if you hear us banging, bang. This place is a fucking maze. If you do get lost, the woman said, you can actually self-extract if you've got the strength and the guts. It's clear. We've spent two weeks and nearly 10,000 rounds making it that way. We'll wait, Rob said. 15 minutes? Should be about that, the guy said. Be back. The hatch shut and locked, and Rob cracked his eyes again. If he looked away from the chem light, the light was only slightly blinding. Rescue, Gwyn said, wonderingly. He hadn't seen her in months, and chem light wasn't usually considered romantic, but she was the prettiest thing he'd ever seen in his life. Like him, she was stark naked, the compartment had been so warm and stuffy, they'd stopped wearing their clothes after the first couple of weeks. Rob went over, sat down next to her, and put his arm around her shoulders. We've got 15 minutes, Rob said. I wonder how we could spend the time. You old goat, Gwyn said, shaking her head. Maybe by getting dressed. Spoil sport. Sunglasses the guy said, sticking a pair through the cracked hatch. We're using tack lights. You're gonna need them, 
And for outside. Outside? Gwyn said wonderingly. What's the weather? It's kicking up, the woman answered. There's a front that's headed down. We may have to suspend ops depending on how bad it gets. Don't look directly at the lights. She opened up the hatch, then paused. Son of a... Are you third officer Gwyneth Stevens? Yes, Gwyn said, holding up her hand to the lights. Son of a gun, Fontana said, laughing. Chris said you got bit. Chris survived? Gwyn said. Her hand flew to her belly, and she looked at Rob. Miss Stevens, the woman said carefully. Chris was on a small boat for two months. Um, don't sweat what happened in the compartment, the guy said. You're not the only one who has been friendly with others, miss. We've got a saying. What happens in the compartment stays in the compartment, the woman said. He found someone, Gwyn said. She couldn't decide if she was hurt or relieved. Sort of, the woman said. He really didn't talk about the boat until we had to board it. We didn't even know about you two until... He told us to look for you. Your body, anyway. For your access card. She finished, pointing at the card on her lanyard. And I'd been around him lots of times. Which, by the way, meant he was really broken up about it. If he'd gotten over you completely, he'd have talked about you. That's how it works, mostly. Look, the guy said. Can we get you two topside and figure out the social political issues later? Mind if I bring my crowbar? Rob said, just in case. You don't get to use it on Chris, Gwyn said. Not gonna, Rob said. I'm afraid he's gonna want to use it on me. When they reached topside, and the twosome were shielding their eyes from the light, Faith reached for her radio, then paused. How do I do this exactly? Better you than me, Fontana said. She switched frequencies and looked around. Sure enough, the Cooper was right off the ship, taking on more survivors. There had been three passengers for every crewman on voyage, but about twice as many crew as passengers had survived. Cooper? Cooper, this is She-Wolf for Cooper Actual, over, Faith said. Cooper, Actual, over. Talk to him, girly, Faith said holding out the radio. Chris? Chris, it's Gwyn. The assault carrier Iwo Jima is in the Bermuda High. So it's out of the storm belt, Steve said, as the toy was tossed by another wave. We need the ammo, we need the guns, and with any luck at all, there will be some surviving marines. He spun the boat to the south and put the hammer down. Behind him, the boats of Wolf Squadron formed themselves into a ragged line and followed. There were ships to clear. Two miles to the north, the cruise ship rocked on a darkling sea, silent as a tomb. To be continued. This has been an Audible Inc. production of Under a Graveyard Sky, written by John Ringo. Narrated by Tristan Morris. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright, 2013, by John Ringo. Production copyright, 2014, by Audible Inc. That was the final segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. Hope you've enjoyed it. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And an Arecibo radio telescope shrunk down to pocket size for easy carrying and free long distance calls to Proxima Centauri, where you can experience a kayak ride in a bioluminescent bay on the watery exoplanet Nuevo San Juan y Bosniak, and where the unit of money is still the dollar, dang it, because it's the gosh darn United States, even if it does have an intelligent bladderfish civilization, and our gratitude and praise to William Ledbetter, Ronald Ferguson, and Amy Ogden, the administrator 
the finalist and the winner of the 2016 Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Awards, given away at the International Space Development Conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 